Matt Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Since the Grammys, I have not been able to get uh, John Baptiste's new Grammy Award winning album out of my head. And this week, uh, his song Cry came to me with these words. Who do you love? Who you gonna love? Who do you love when push comes to shove? How does it feel when it's getting too real? Now, maybe you're not a John Baptiste fan. <laughs> well, that's okay. Our hymnal sings, God is love, and where true love is, God is there. These are Jesus' last instructions to his disciple, a command uh, to love. Now, perhaps you all who have been to an Episcopal wedding will have heard that passage from Paul's Corinthians, chapter 13. Uh, Love is patient, love is kind, it's not self-seeking, keeps no record of wrongs. Well, Paul uh, didn't just make that up, it turns out. It's at the core of Jesus' own teaching. Jesus gives in this passage from John a commandment. His statement is clear that if we are to be known as followers of Jesus, then we first must be known as people who love. We are to love one another as Jesus has loved us. The word, interestingly, chosen here in Scripture is must. You must love. Not, hey, if you're feeling good today, why don't you try some love? Right? Not, do you like that person? Uh, Give them some love. Uh, If you don't like them, now you're off the hook. There's none of that in there. This is a must-love situation. And it's always amazing to me how we remember all these other passages of Scripture, but we never remember this one. How come this one doesn't come first to our mind every day when we wake up, if we're to be disciples of Jesus? Now, it is true, and I think we should be honest, that Christian history is not on the side of this argument. (laughs) Uh, But neither is political history. Neither is societal history. Neither are the burdens that we heap upon each other. So it may be a reforming idea, but either way, we can't let ourselves off the hook. So let's explore this a little bit and begin by understanding that love is first a gift to us. Love is not something that requires a return in, on its investment. There's no ROI for you business people here. Uh, Uh, Scholar Raymond Brown says, love is a gift. Like other gifts, it's a a Christian dispensation. It comes from God through Jesus into the world. One of the passages that he he catches, that Brown catches for me, he says, "The, the, the love that Jesus has for his followers is not effective only, but it is an effective love. Certainly, love is expressed in Christ laying down his life, an act of love for all humanity. Again, we might turn to Paul in Romans 12 to understand how we are as individuals to make love effectual. First, we have to recognize that it's not just a spiritual act. In other words, you can't just say, well, I love them, but. There's no but in Jesus' commandment. But it is a bodily act. And what do I mean by that? That means because that we're so effective as human beings that we're mostly affected by anger, resentment, hate, 
and other motions which are part of the body. And not only that, they have a similar chemical signature as love. So it's easy to get them confused or to think that they're of equal importance. These then are born through social constructs and reorient our bodies to have an immediate reaction to those we're not supposed to love. So through culture and through our own physical makeup, we are actually wired to narrow the focus of love. And that is what makes Jesus so radical, is that he doesn't narrow the focus of love, but actually calls for a physical as well as mental and spiritual transformation. To discern the mind of love is to move beyond the normative lizard mind of reaction. This will also mean to humble ourselves before those that we see in front of us. To receive grace enough from God to take a lowlier place. There was once a priest who said, I'm not trying to be above reproach, I'm trying to be below reproach. <laughs> the point here is that until we humble ourselves in front of those that we call enemy, those we don't like or have wronged us, those who were wired to hate. We're really not able to understand the commandment to care and wash and feed the least among us. I don't think Jesus was just saying it's nice if you go to the back of the room so that you may be invited to the front of the room later on. It's about being last and lowly and beginning from that standpoint. You see, in our kinship, we are a unified body of people, not by our work, but by God's union and by God's love. Love first comes from the divine. We don't make it happen. <laughs> we love because it is supposed to be and intended to be our nature. And so this brings us to another piece. Important today is these Folks stand before us and renew their vows and as you renew your own baptismal vows and that is that we must reject evil we shouldn't be afraid to call evil what it is oh that makes people upset because I'm meddling in your business now we know what's good and we do know what's right and sometimes it's different than what's politically right God calls us to reject and cast out evil. What this means is that when people seek to destroy the dignity of others, to bring them low, to degrade them, to threaten them, to be mean-spirited, to want their way over anyone else's way, to raise their estate by climbing on the backs of others, ghosting, gaslighting, or any other form of destruction of the body or soul of individuals, we have to reject that behavior and say, no, we are commanded to love. <laughs> Instead, we love and we are not afraid of confronting what Paul calls childish behavior because Paul sees it as non-Christian behavior, people who haven't been raised up high enough to see God's love first and then to seek the solution for the problems that are in the world. So I will tell you, I could care less what anybody thinks about formula. But as a Christian, I must call all people to figure out how to get some formula into some people's hands. That's the call of love. To rise above the division and say, that doesn't matter. What matters is babies are going to go hungry if we don't get formula to them. So how do we do it? How do you do it, government? How do we do it, church? You see, in this new age of mission, we must rethink the boundaries of God's love. Somehow, religion is a private affair, resurrecting old arguments against those who suggest that God has limitations for the directions of God's love. No, instead, we must recognize a victory of love by God in Christ Jesus, an effective act that pours out in time and space from Golgotha, any Christian community daring 
to call itself such must relearn and engage the commandment of love for one another. The Christian today, the Episcopalian today, and the church, whatever you may call it, we must frequent God's message of love and become vessels of God's love in the world to a world in search of something greater than the world's promises of wealth and superhero immortality for those seeking more than an eye for an eye or seeking to diminish others so as to grow in their own stature the gospel is clear that is not love the gospel of god in this time is one of such love that we must seek to make more of it by word and example by changing the way our bodies behave and our spirits would first act to become effective examples within our communities and in the world around us for where God is there must be love in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter at Texas Bishop and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.